This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Have your Bibles open at Revelation chapter 11. After I pray, we'll study, that is, we'll continue the series that I'm delivering on the tribulation, the great tribulation period. After I pray, we'll read. Directors, our Father, in Jesus' name, lead me, O God. I pray that you will put a guard at my lips and forbid me to utter one word that ought not be spoken. Help me to speak the words that will be words of soberness and truth, rightly dividing thy word. May souls be blessed, may sinners be saved, may Christians be enlightened and encouraged in these dark days. And we believe that these are the days known in the word of God as the beginning of sorrows. We are nearing that time when great wrath will be poured out upon this earth. But thank you, Father, that the church will be taken out and the born again will not be here when the hour of temptation strikes. Thy will be done today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read one verse in Daniel and make a few statements, and then we'll read where I ask you to open your Bibles, Revelation 11. Now, this verse in Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, reading on down, and I will not, this is Daniel 9, I read verse 24. If you read on down, you'll find that the 70 weeks are divided into three periods. Now, if you have my book on Daniel, verse by verse, I have a commentary on Daniel Verse by verse, the book contains, I'm looking, over 500 pages. This book contains over 500 pages. It's a hardback book. It has a beautiful hardback. And in this commentary on Daniel, verse by verse, on page 373, I have the outline of the 70 weeks. Now, if you do not have this commentary... You can order one from the Gospel Hour. Now, I, I, again, I insist. The only reason I bring this up is because it would take an entire broadcast for me to give you this on the radio. But here I have the outline of the 70 weeks pointing out the divisions and giving to you the names of great Bible scholars who have searched the records of history, sacred and secular, and they have proven beyond any shadow of doubt that Daniel's prophecy has been literally fulfilled up to the last, that is, the 70th week. 69 weeks have been literally fulfilled in every minute detail, and there remains only one week, the 70th week, to be fulfilled, and that will be the reign of the Antichrist. Now, in Revelation 11 and verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Now, notice that conjunction, and. Read chapter 10, if you will. I don't have time today. It has only 11 verses. Chapter 10 of Revelation, you read it. And the word that begins verse 1 in chapter 11 is a conjunction connecting it to the preceding chapter. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Now we would say a yardstick or a rule or a tape measure. And the angel, uh, listen what he did now, stood saying, rise. 
and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now, the temple will be rebuilt after the rapture. Now, let me clear up something here. I'm sure that many people listening to me remember Dr. Mordecai Ham. If I'm not mistaken, he lived in Louisville, and he traveled the world over. That is, he was known around the world as one of the greatest evangelists. In his day, he was the greatest in that day. Now, I heard him in person, and I heard him make this statement in a tabernacle in Greenville, South Carolina. He made the statement that the Jews have the stones cut to build the temple when they get the ground. Now, it's true that they are in possession of the ground now, but in reality, they are not in possession because if you see the Mosque of Omar is there, and of course, in the eight-day war, they conquered the ground where the temple area is. But if they should take a bulldozer and push the Mosque of Omar off that ground, you know as well as I do that the entire Arab world would pounce on Israel immediately. You know that. And the United Nations would not stand for it because, now listen, beloved, the Mosque of Omar to the Arab world is the most holy place and the sacred place to the Muslim world. Now, to the Jew, that is the place where the temple was. And when the rapture occurs, and when they are, that is, when the Antichrist gives them the land and permits them to, they will rebuild the temple right there where the Mosque of Omar is today. And the Antichrist will sit in that temple, announcing that he is the Messiah, Christ. Now, I want that clear because some have written in and asked me where I got the information. I heard Dr. Ham make the statement from the platform of a tabernacle in Greenville. Uh, oh, 37, it was a year after I was converted. I've been converted, I've been born again 38 years. So it was 37 years ago. And he said that he had that uh, information on good authority. Now, I can't give you the names now because I've forgotten, but I do remember that Dr. Ham made the statement that the Jews have the stones cut to build the temple. Now, I can't prove that. I'm telling you what he said. But I'm saying this, that after the rapture, the temple will be rebuilt. Now, this, of course, that temple will be destroyed. I'm not talking about the temple that Jesus will sit in and reign Now, that temple, the temple that Jesus will reign from, the tabernacle of David will be built, and uh, Jesus will reign for 1,000 years during the millennium in the temple. Now, the temple will be rebuilt, as I said. The Antichrist will sit in the temple, announcing that he's God. Now, let's read on down. And he said, uh, but the cord which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty-two months. Now, forty-two months, if you look in the book of Daniel, that is where I told you a moment ago, in the commentary that I have written, prepared, and if you read the calendar and study it and run the references, you'll see that a prophetic year is a year of 360 days, 30 days to the month, and I prove that by giving you scripture references on Daniel 24 through 26. If you'll study those verses, I give you the references, and by the way, I gave them to you on the radio the last broadcast. I gave you those references proving that a prophetic month is a 30-day month, a prophetic year is a 360-day year, and three and a half years would be 1,260 days, And three and a half years will be the last half of Daniel's 70th week. And that's the time when the Antichrist will break the covenant and all hell will break out here upon this earth. And it will be a time of sorrow and misery and suffering such as has never been since God created Adam. Now, the Gentiles will tread underfoot the holy city 42 months. 
And at the end of the 42 months, 1260 days, the Gentile power will be broken, crushed, and destroyed with the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And of course, the stone is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, I think it is most interesting, and I'd like to point it out to you, that the Gentile power began with an image, a giant image, in Daniel chapter 2. Now, I can't read it. I wish you would read all of Daniel 2. You remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he had a vision, and his astrologers and his scientists and all of his great men could not interpret the dream. Now, Daniel was, of course, one of the Hebrews, and God blessed him, and God was with the Hebrews, and he asked for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom, and he revealed to Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of the vision that he had. And in Daniel 2 and verse 31 we read, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now, he, destri- he describes to Nebuchadnezzar the image, the head, the breast, the arms, the belly, the thighs, the legs, the feet, and so on. And so he explains to him that he is that gigantic power. He'll be the head of that great power. And he is king of, uh, that is, the great king. And God set him up a great king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Now notice that. He didn't say the king of kings, but a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Now that's in verse 37 of Daniel chapter 2. So Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold. Now the Gentile power, this great Gentile system, was fulfilled in Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And, of course, fragments of the Roman Empire still exist upon the face of the earth today. And after the rapture, the Gentile power will tread underfoot. That is, they will trample under their feet during the last half of the tribulation period, the holy city. And it will be a time of destruction and murder and bloodshed. Now then, let me point out that the Gentile dominion, the powerful, powerful Gentile dominion, not only started with an image, but it will climax or come to its end with an image. In Revelation chapter 13, in verse 11, we read of the beast out of the earth, and we read that he exercises great power. Then in verse 13, this is Revelation 13, 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now then, the Gentile world power started with the gigantic, magnificent, and in the words of Daniel, terrible image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the vision. Now the Gentile world power headed up by the Antichrist, the political beast, and the religious beast and the false prophet will come to a climax in the presence of a gigantic image made of stone. And this image made of hard rock, stone, will be given the power to speak. And all who will not worship the image will be put to death. And what a terrible, terrible time that will be. Now, Paul tells us in Romans 11 that God has not forgotten his people. He said, I am of the seed of Abraham. 
and he assures all and sundry that God has not forgotten his elect nation, his people to whom he made promises that have never been fulfilled in their entirety. God will not, God cannot, God shall not break one promise that he made to faithful Father Abraham. And so one day, one day God will turn again to his nation, his people, the elect, the apple of his eye. Now remember, I said some time ago, and don't you forget it, no man will go to heaven because he is just a Jew or just a Gentile. Men do not go to heaven because of their nationality. But we must not shut our eyes in race hatred and hate certain people, whether it be a black man, a white man, a Jew, a Gentile, rich or poor, it matters not. You must not hate people because it is uh, it is uh, popular to hate and despise certain people because of their race, because of their color in this day of hatred. And this is a day of hatred, and you know as well as I know it. Selfishness and hatred and such a spirit will uh, be evident when the Antichrist comes into power. This world will be filled with misery and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And the righteous will be hated as never before. But I'm saying that there is an elect. There is a remnant. There is a group of people who are the true, pure seed of Abraham to whom God will fulfill every promise that he made in the Old Testament to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and so on. Now, during this time, the 42 months, when the Antichrist will put pressure on the people and the Gentiles will tread down the holy city, during this time, God will send two witnesses to this earth to prophesy. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score, and that's one thousand two hundred and sixty year or days rather, which will be three and a half years, and they'll be clothed in sackcloth. Now these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And remember the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and God did not create this earth to be run and ruled and run over by the devil. Now, God's going to take it back one of these days. The devil is the god of this age. The devil is the prince of the power of the air. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world. And they that dwell therein. And one day God will reclaim. He will take again this earth from the evil and make it righteous. And it will be covered with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters now cover the sea. These two olive trees, candlesticks, will stand before God, the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, on the next broadcast, I'll name the two witnesses. That is, I'll give you the names that I believe will be the two men who will witness during the last half of a horrible, horrible tribulation period. As I've said day after day, week after week, I've said, if you're born again, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about if you're born again. But if you're not born again, you have nothing to look forward to but misery and despair. And I plead with you to bow your head and give your heart to Jesus this very moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, for his sake, for his honor and glory, save many souls, deepen conviction, draw mightily all who are not born again, and save that soul that's nearest hell for Christ's sake. Amen.